Are you a blockhead? That's what scientists thought our brains were essentially at a certain stage in our life. Our, our brains were like cement they couldn't learn. But re recent studies and illustrations from the book we're reading, The Shallows, what the internet is doing to our brains, says something different, that our minds are plastic, they're malleable. Sally and I will be continuing our book review of The Shallows. It will also be interesting, a giveaway for anybody who is submitting a review to us of a software product, website, hardware product, a new Nexus 7 to be given away. You've got to enter to win. All that, our picks and tips and listener feedback, Stay tuned. This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Hello again, everybody. This is Martin Spriggs with Wells Tech. This is episode 310 for October 8th, 2013. This is a podcast about technology and ministry and where those two intersect. And we come to you each week to talk about the tools that you might find useful in your own ministry, whether that be professional or personal. But I don't come alone. I always come with a partner, a very capable partner from the beautiful climbs of New Ulm, Minnesota. Any frost on the ground over there, Sally Draper? Not this morning, Martin, but I don't think our days are coming. Are our days like are coming. That's right. Hey, you got all gussied up for us today. Put on a tie and everything. Look at that. Must, must be must be a special, special day. Occasion. Nothing really to do with the podcast, but at the new Senate offices called CMM, Center for Mission and Ministry, we're having an open house today beginning at 3 o'clock. So we were all supposed to come in business attire. So that's the first time in my recollection that that's ever happened. Normally it's business casual around here. And sometimes, you know, people get uh, gussied up for different occasions, meetings and such. And occasionally you'll see me in a suit and tie like today. But uh, this was mandatory for everybody. So it's interesting to see some of the folks who don't normally wear the suit and tie uh, uh, come with one. So it's kind of cool around here today. So we're going to take a little team picture. Unfortunately, Sally, you're not going to be in it. We'll have to put some Photoshop skills to That maybe we work. can do. That <laughs> we can so do. I got gussied up this weekend myself, Martin. I was uh, I had the opportunity to speak at the Martin Luther College Ladies Auxiliary. Oh, nice. It was a lot of fun. Uh, they gave me the topic of staying connected with technology, and I shared uh, Google Hangouts. I even played a little bit of our Google Hangout that we do each week to give them an idea of what it was like. Cool. Yeah, it was a lot of fun and uh, just wonderful to connect uh, with ladies who have such a heart for the ministry efforts going on at MLC. So, yeah, a great uh, day. Any kind of ladies group, and this is, should hope this doesn't come across as sexist, but um, anytime I get a chance to present to ladies, is it's fun. They're always so uh, engaged and appreciative, and uh, you know, it's just an uplifting experience, and it sounds like that was that way for you, too. It was, and they were excited to share their faith through technology as well. So definitely a tie-in to Wells Tech. Um, it's just wonderful that God has given us these tools and that we can put them to good use um, in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Very good. Sally, we're going to continue uh, looking at our brains. We had begun the series um, a month ago called The Shallows by Nicholas Carr. In fact, we had talked about this book uh, a number of months ago when we had Professor Tess on from Wisconsin Lutheran College where he's going to be presenting on this topic, I believe, at the State Teachers Conference here in Wisconsin. But uh, in that conversation, we understood that how, how profoundly it kind of shaped his approach to teaching and even though we're only through the first four chapters and we're going to take chapters two, three, and four today, uh, I can see how that would happen where it's a little bit different way of looking at technology and specifically how the mind um, adapts 
or changes as a result of the technologies around us. So all these chapters really get really deep into how the mind works and how it changes over time with the different inputs that come into it. Yeah, Martin, and you kind of tipped your our hat a little bit in what you just said because I think um, a lot of the focus, at least in Chapter 2, is that uh, up until recent times, most people thought our brains were pretty much set in stone. Once you reached adulthood, things just couldn't really change in our brains. And um, Chapter 2 especially walks us through a lot of the historical psychological studies and things um, that actually have come around to the fact that our brains are a little bit more plastic rather than concrete. So things can change there. Things aren't set in stone. And I think um, that kind of lays the premise for the whole rest of the book, the fact that we know we're experiencing it, we're living it, that the way we think and, and interact is changing because of the internet and um, you know that brain research ties into that. Yeah, a couple of key words that they use were uh, that he uses were malleable and plastic, and that's what all the recent research suggests that it that it is shapeable. It has the ability to change given uh, different circumstances. But he did make the distinction that it's plastic, not elastic. So it's not. Uh, it's not so changeable that it that it's so easy to stretch and pull and whatever that you can do it real easily. He did say that you can still get stuck, you know, in your old ways. Uh, but the the real point is, it doesn't have to be that way uh, as long as um, you understand the fact that you know, given different circumstances, you can uh, the the mind can change. Yeah, I have a real life example of that. My uh oldest son when he was elementary age had some vision difficulties and went through a series of vision therapy exercises and as they explained it to us our, our brain connections are almost like cross-country skiing like making a pathway through the snow um, that you beat down over time and that it stays in place once you've made those brain connections you can change the way the brain thinks and for him it was certainly true he was you know somebody I might call dyslexic but that really wasn't what was going on there was just some brain um, things his brain had learned that we were able to retrain and now he's a great reader and obviously can see very well um, because of those exercises so I definitely saw it demonstrated yep one one thing that I'm taking away from this book and this really isn't the intention of the book but as I'm reading along and now we're through four chapters is how amazing the brain is and um, how how awesome God is as a creator who created such an instrument in us. Um, he works these these miracles every day. Anytime the the brain adapts, the body adapts, and there's all kinds of stories about that. When you lose a sense, the others get heightened. How God has created our bodies and and uh, our minds like that to be able to adapt to to circumstances, and that's. Uh, that's a cool thing to be able to look at and read a book that clearly doesn't have God in mind and they talk a little bit about evolution throughout and uh, the fact that you know these these amazing tools that we have were given to us as a gift from God most definitely one example that they give about uh, how the brain can work in that way is um, with some monkeys there was a, a study done where they actually sliced the nerve endings in a monkey's palm um, of their hands and the brain was really confused and so they did um, you know give some kind of stimulus to that area of the palm and the brain would think it was from their knee or something like that you know it didn't know how to to process the stimulus it was receiving because the nerve endings had been broken but they did this over time and after a few a period of a few weeks the brain responded appropriately the brain retrained itself even though um, things have been severed it it learned and retrained to associate the correct stimulus to the correct part of the brain and know where that was coming from so again just a demonstration of how amazing um, God created our brains to be yeah 
One illustration where he gets a little bit into the technology side of things and how it can affect our brains was a little section from Nietzsche, uh, who's a, a, a German philosopher and writer. He started to, uh, and this was at the time where um, typewriters were just beginning to, to be invented. Um, he wrote most of his stuff until he started to um, go blind. So his, his sight diminished, and so he had to transcribe. You know, somebody had to to uh, write for him until the typewriter came along, and he could now write again. Um, but what happened to his writing style was interesting. So before. Um, he had a, a more fluid, maybe more um, creative approach to writing, but uh, some of the people who read his work after he started using the typewriter, which was a very physical, very exacting instrument, a new technology that forced you into constraints, uh, his, his, his readers said his writing became tighter and more telegraphic, a new forcefulness, more direct, which which is kind of an interesting statement as you think about how the tool has influenced the writing style and and maybe for some of us who lived on both sides of the of the computer you know we can maybe relate to that too or even both sides of letter writing versus emails there's definitely a difference isn't there definitely and I'm just thinking about with a typewriter there's that physical sound even with my computer keyboard I want the the clicky kind of keyboard as opposed to the silent and I think that does add to um, the way that I write yeah, something's getting done or something needs yeah. to get done yeah absolutely mm -hmm. so we go on a, a little bit of chapter three um, which we've entitled I forget what the, the true chapter that the uh, chapter title is, but Maps and Clocks is how we, we've identified it. And it's an interesting study of the invention of these two tools, maps and clocks. Uh, specifically clocks I was interested in as I was reading along. I didn't know a couple of the facts that were brought out here. Uh, monks were the first ones that really demanded clocks. Before the time of the monks there was really no need. People just kind of gauged their day by sun up and sun down. It was light, it was dark, they were hungry. Um, you know the work was done, the work wasn't done. So there really was no need to divide up time. Um, but in a monastic life everything is driven by ritual and something needs to happen on a very regular basis. So the monks said we need a timekeeping piece so as a result monasteries were the where were the first clocks were even assembled um, and how clocks changed their life uh, and now if you think about it how we are driven by clocks. Sally you and I really start this podcast at 8 a.m. every Tuesday morning regardless. I mean it's on the schedule. I have a calendar that reminds me that it's time to start and when it gets past 8 o'clock I get a little nervous, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And the, the same thing happens with a lot of the inventions that have sprung up since the clock. You think of television. You know things are run on a schedule. They just don't start when they're gonna start. I mean they're on a schedule. The, the 10 o'clock news starts at 10 o'clock every time that's right and and it was interesting to read this it's almost like watching um, the effects of timekeeping and clocks you know slowly infiltrate our lives um, it talked about from the monasteries each town had a clock and so people listened to the peeling for the peeling of the bell and the town clock um, you know to know when they should go do the next step of their day or whatever it may be it talked about um, you know, kingdoms having clocks and the the um, upper level of society having clocks and then clocks getting smaller and smaller down to our wrist. And, and so what he's demonstrating here is this progression over time of this technology into um, all these aspects of our lives to the point that, yeah, when 8 o'clock on Tuesday morning hits, if you're not calling me for the podcast, I think something's wrong with you, you know? So we are very driven by it now. Turned out the, 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 the bloodhounds, yes. Yeah. <laughs> very wrong. <laughs> um, and that's interesting because throughout this chapter, that's really the point of it is how seemingly small technologies and introductions and inventions change things in our lives and how we 
not just how we do things, but how we think and how our brain works. You know, what, what creates stress now never created stress before. So okay. it's, it's interesting. A couple interesting quotes. Uh, he says, every technology is an expression of human will. So everything that we've created was created for uh, a reason associated with something that the human wanted to do or wanted to do differently. And then he categorizes the inventions or the technologies into four groupings, which was really interesting as well. He said there's a whole group of technologies uh, that extends the physical. So the, the invention of the plow, the invention of the darning needle, the, the invention of the fighter jet, those all extended what we couldn't do as effectively just on our own, the bicycle. It was another example of that. So we can't um, go as fast. The car would be an example of that, too. We can't uh, move as fast as uh, on our own two feet as we could in a car or a fighter jet. The second category was extends the senses. So things like the microscope and the Geiger counter. You know, we can't detect a metal by ourselves in the sand. Or we can't see um, you know, an atom, but we can with these new technologies. Third category was something that reshapes nature or controls nature, like the reservoir or uh, geneticized corn, you know, those kinds of things. And then finally, the one that I think the rest of the book is going to deal with and how these really shape our brains are those that extend the intellect or the intellectual side and how they remap our brains to think differently, like the map, like the clock. Um, he says the most intimate tools, these, these, this category, are the most intimate tools. They are used for self-expression, they shape personal and public identity, and they affect cultivating relationships with others. And then he kind of gives us a definition uh, called the intellectual ethic, which he defines as a set of assumptions about how the human mind works or should work. And um, that's really the point of this last group and really the point of the book, how the Internet, uh, and I'm kind of guessing now since I haven't read the whole yeah. book, how the Internet uh, has affected how people think the mind should work, how much you should memorize, um, why don't we just let Google be our brains, or how social networks have changed that, or the hyper-connectivity you know, of our brains uh, what that is doing to us or how it should work. So what are the cultural norms? Um, so that's that's really an interesting definition and, and there's a lot to that. And so from that point in chapter 3 where he's got us thinking about this intellectual ethic, he devotes chapter 4 to another um, historical look at a major change in society and the way our brains work and that is from the oral to the written tradition. So he turns back the hands of time yet again and helps us understand the oral tradition and how everything was conveyed um, through speech and what good listeners we were back in the day and that kind of thing. And then he looks at um, the transition to writing things down from the basics of just marking things on a stone to actually um, starting to develop scrolls and um, alphabets and characters and things like that to, to record things. And it was interesting to me, I'd never really studied that period of time, but as they begin to write things down, um, they wrote them for oral sharing. It wasn't like they were writing things to extend their conversations that they were used to having. They were more or less just recording what could be shared orally. And he even brought out that uh, silent reading was unheard of. Right. Nobody right. would um, do that. And when people started doing that, they thought they there thought was something was wrong crazy. with them, basically. It was just yes. such an oddity. Um, but yeah, the, the transition was slow to the written text. Um, the, uh, initially the words were all run together, there was no spacing, there was no punctuation. Um, it was meant to be reread, and he even said, you know, or to have your slaves read it to you or whatever. Um, but when they made that crossover to the written text and the deeper thinking that could come from that, there was even a lot of debate over whether that was good or better than the oral um, tradition. Um, 
that's when intellect really started to change and the brain developed differently to to have this deeper thinking to be lost in a book it wasn't a natural thing to to um, to read and be focused on a book we were also we were all kind of more prone to look away and be distracted and not be as focused you know so the right. brain changed and um, then of course he gets into the whole Gutenberg Gutenberg press thing and the effect of the printable type and and how things just really took off from there and how much was was published then good bad and ugly that got into print but people were reading and because they were reading then their brains were changing in the process yep. this should this whole conversation should resonate with those of us that are uh, you know, biblically inclined because as you think about the oral tradition that definitely is the case in the Old and the New Testament where even much of the New Testament was written to be read you know these were letters to groups of people it wasn't just a letter that was going to get passed around to teach one of the the citizens of Ephesus or the congregation at Ephesus this was these were letters that were meant to be to be read to to a large group and even today and, and a lot of this <laughs> Sal you really have to read Marshall McLuhan I think because a lot of this goes back it's got to go back to you know, some things he said about this because when we when we did the study of the hidden power of electronic culture by Shane Hips, he talks about this exact same thing. The move, and the, most of the book is really about this, the move from the oral tradition to the written tradition and how that may be good or bad or, or different or things that we need to, to be careful about as we think about it. But as, as I look at my own life and how I study and read the Bible, I get a lot more out of my Bible study in a group where we're actually reading and discussing rather than I'm sitting all home alone independently studying um, and that's just I think how the, the brain works and is wired and how God's Word was really meant to be shared uh, in in that uh, community of Christians in a fellowshipping environment where we can encourage one another share um, uh, share things about what we've read and how God's Word is, is touching you um, so that's I'm right on with this chapter. I think there's there's a lot more to be said here, but that's uh, I think uh, I'm I'm excited to go to the next chapter and see what see what's coming up. Yeah, so he concludes this chapter, um, and I think we could conclude our discussion today with kind of like, what does this mean? We've we spent a, t a lot of time looking at. Um, you know, brain research and these historical looks at these major shifts in the way the brain processes things, the way brain reacts to, you know, time and, and written tradition and that kind of thing. So um, we've set a historical context for the, the kind of changes that can happen and we've seen it demonstrated. Now we've got to realize we're living this. We're right in the middle of a major brain shift <laughs> if you want to call it that and um, he kind of concludes the chapter with yeah we're gonna remain literate we're not gonna go back to oral tradition only but um, he says the world of the screen um, our computers our laptops always being with us always being connected it's a very different place from the world of the page and a new intellectual ethic is taking hold the pathways in our brains are once again being rerouted so that sets the stage to see whether this stuff is good or bad that's going on in our brains I think yep. that's what the rest of the book will be about yep good stuff so if you'd like to follow along again the book is the shallows what the internet is doing to our brains probably available at your public library if you're like me grab it on Kindle um, buy the book on Amazon I think we've got a link probably on the show notes page to those resources Nicholas Carr is the author again we just finished chapter four so we'll pick up with chapter five are we grouping we're gonna group again We'll see, I guess. We need to do a little bit more reading. We'll, we'll let you know before the next time we talk about it. It'll yeah. be in, in November before we're, so we're ready to chapter talk. Chapter 5 in, in November. So mm -hmm. good, good reading, good discussion. So. Definitely. Sally, let's move on to our ministry resources segment. All right. I'm going to do a quick screen share. And I just wanted to make mention of a blog post I found this week. It's from the Church Juice blog, and it's called Ways to Improve Your Church Bulletin. 
So for those of you in the church office who struggle weekly with um, the best way to convey things in your church bulletin, here's a few um, quick points to, to help guide your way, including highlight fewer items. If you really want people to absorb important information, don't give them content overload. Give them what's most important and leave the rest for somewhere else. Um, no paragraphs of text. People don't want to sift through pages of nonstop words. Hmm, they're moving away from that literate, uh, written society, it seems. Uh, content organization, um, how, you're la how you lay out the bulletin makes a big difference. Include a white space, a great ideal of simple design is to leave room for your content to breathe. Every square inch of paper doesn't have to be covered. Um, boy, I can remember some church bulletins that were just like solid black, and mm -hmm. that's just a little too much for me. Um, images and graphics, these items can enhance your storytelling. Um, and then let it go. Sometimes we hold on to things longer than we should. If your bulletin is one of those items, um, it may not be effective anymore. You may want to consider doing something besides a bulletin. So um, there's lots of ideas here and things for you to consider if you're doing the church bulletin. And again, this comes from the Church Juice blog. It's at churchjuice.reframemedia.com. Martin, you're familiar with Church Juice. Yep, we, I think we've referenced them before, and it's just that's probably the ministry resource you know, pick, so to speak, not just the article, although that's a great one, is just you know, make sure you, you, you bookmark that site or put that into your RSS reader. There are some good things that come through that. Um, the subtitle, Emerging Church Communications, and I think what they try and do is focus on things that, uh, I wouldn't say progressive churches, but churches that are really focusing on good communications are trying. So it's a matter of figuring out what's the best channel for my audience and they've got some good tips and tricks in there so good stuff excellent alright shall we move on to our listener reviews section <laughs> and uh, while we do not have a re listener review we do have an announcement to make and that is the simple fact that we are going to be offering a little giveaway to our listeners for submitting a listener review. So up until May 31st, uh, 2014, we will accept any reviews and we would like reviews on, can be a product review, can be a software review, can be a website review. It does need to be of some quality, um, obviously, so we would like, you know, obviously for it to be useful you know, for folks. But the giveaway would be a Nexus 7 tablet. So uh, if you submit a review, you'll be put in the pool, and you may be the proud owner of a new uh, Nexus 7 tablet from Google, um, valued at 229 And uh, I've owned these in the past. These are great little tablets. Um, the, the upgraded one, this one, this newest Nexus 7, has just a gorgeous, gorgeous screen, great battery life, and um, a nice addition to your, uh, to your gadget warehouse, so to speak. So uh, please submit those listener reviews. Sally, how do they submit those? Well, they can send it to us in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm over on the reviews page on Wells Tech, and we have a special page where we'll link to whatever you send in. You can do a written, um, maybe a blog post on your own site. You can write us an email with your review or post it on Facebook or Google+. Uh, you can send us audio or video. We'd love to have a YouTube video that we could play right in the show. That would be awesome. Um, and uh, interestingly, Martin, uh, Pastor Matt Arnold sent us a review of the Nexus 7 tablet so if you want to check the out old, that cool prize. I think prize. that might be the old one actually so <laughs> it's the new one's even better. Okay cool so yeah head on uh, you know contact us however you want and uh, we'll get it posted on this reviews page. Okay great. Next segment of the show is our fairly recent edition of our chip of the week and uh, I have been 
traditionally going first in this, so I'll do that again. My tip of the week, and this is no surprise, we've uh, been doing some reading lately, The Shallows, what the Internet is doing to our brains, and I have that on my Kindle. So I bought the digital app, so I've been using my Kindle app and really enjoying it. But one of the tips that I have for you, and I think most everybody's familiar with how the Kindle works, uh, you can get a Kindle, a physical device, or you can install the the Kindle app on a Nexus 7 or an iPad like I have. And you can even do it on the web. But one of the great things about the tool is the ability to highlight and uh, add notation to the book, just like you could, like writing in the margins. So that's, as uh, Sally and I are reading through this, that's what I'm doing to kind of uh, refresh my memory as we're, as we're doing the show. I'll page through and I'll look for my highlights. So if you are watching at home, I'll just show my, oh, where'd it go? There it is. Now you can't even see it, can you? Mm-mm. There. It's so faint, you can't even see it because I got that light shining in my face. But anyway, uh, so you've got paragraphs, and uh, maybe if I hold a little bit further back, yeah, you can kind of see it back here. Um, and I used pink as the color that I wanted to highlight. But the, and it's really easy, you just tap and you, you uh, uh, expand the selection and then pick the color you want, and it just highlights it in, in the app. But the best part about it is, at some point, you may want to review those notes. So there's a little click, there's a little button at the top, at least in the iPad version, that you can click, that'll show your notebook, or it's called My Notebook. And in your notebook for this particular book, you have all the notes or the highlights that you've taken. So in my case, all of the things I highlighted are in pink, and it shows what I highlighted. You know, so I don't have to drill down. And then in gray, to separate it from the ones that are highlighted, are the ones that I've taken notes on. And you can even star those so that you can you know, pull them up as a favorite. But if I click on this, I can edit the note and resave it, or I can delete it. Or from here, if I want to go to the page in the book where that physical item is, where I added that notation, there's a little icon there. I just click that, and I go immediately to that section of the book where I made the notation. So this has application for anybody who uses eBooks, and especially eBooks on the, on the Kindle. So if you're a student and you're reading books, this is a great way to take notes. You've got all the notes together. So if you want to do a review, you can just go to your My Notebook section, and it's going to pull up all your notes. Uh, you can jump back and forth into uh, the area of the book where the note was taken or the highlight was made or just read the highlight again. This is a great way to study uh, if you're looking at just a tool that will quickly go through the relevant points. It's kind of kind of like paging through a book and, and uh, highlighting you know with the you know the the, the uh, the yellow or the the bright orange or the the bright blue marker you know, highlighter. Uh, this does the exact same thing, except you don't have to be distracted by all the things that are around it. So that's my tip of the week. That's a great tip, Martin. I've highlighted, and I didn't know I could get back to the full list of everything. So you were just paging through and looking yeah, for it. Yeah, looking for here. it, wondering Got why I'm the yeah. app. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> much better to find it that way. Very, Very good. good. Sally, you have a tip. I do, and my tip is related to Google Forms. So I'm going to do a quick screen share again. Um, lately, my life has been doing a lot of Google Forms. It's revolved around that. Um, and I did Google Forms. I did a Google Form for the Minnesota State Teachers Conference registration. I did Google Forms to survey um, the MLC uh, faculty on tech topics. And most recently, I've done a Google Form for my son's Suzuki School of Music recital registration. And I love Google Forms because they're easy to share. This this particular form I can share with the, the music teachers so they can see if all their students have signed up for recitals yet or whatever it may be. They're super easy to create as well. You can add um, you know, new items very easily. There's all different types of question types. Um, but that's really not what I am talking about today. 
What I'm talking about is something I thought was a shortcoming of Google Forms, and that was with other form tools in the creation of the form process, there's usually a place to tell it to email the responses to me. Because I want to know how many people have responded and when they respond and things like that, potentially. Rather than having to go look and see if anyone's responded, I wanted it to tell me that. And I had looked and looked on the form creation tool and not found that as an option. Um, just a little bit more about Google Forms. You create the form. You have a link they provide to the live form where people can input the data. That's the link you share with people. And then the third part of a Google Form is it writes the results to a spreadsheet. And as it turns out, in the associated spreadsheet, there is a way to have the form notify you when someone submits a response. And that's under the Tools menu in the spreadsheet. There's a link called Notification Rules. And there you have the option to notify you at your email address every time something changes. Um, and you can even tell, me, tell it to notify you right away or to do a daily digest. And here's an option down here to notify you when a user submits a form. Um, so lots of different ways to get notification via email um, of form submissions. And that's pretty much my tip. This was a big deal for me because that was something I felt like was missing um, when I worked with the form. I didn't realize it was actually kind of hidden away over on the spreadsheet under the tools menu, notification rules. So that's your tip. Very cool. Yeah. So I have a related question. Maybe, um, maybe you know the answer. One of our listeners knows the answer. I am putting together a conference that you're going to be attending out in Las Vegas, and we've put a Google form together where people can submit workshop topics. Um, it's an unconference type of conference where the attendees get to craft the agenda. So we're asking ahead of time for people to uh, share what. Uh, what these breakout sessions should be. What I'd like to do now is allow uh, build a Google form that would allow them to vote on, let's say, the top five. Um, so I'm not. I think there are probably third-party tools out there, but I'd like to actually stay with the, within the Google uh, you know form space or the Google Docs space to allow to, to build some kind of tool that would allow them to, let's say, check five you know of the thirty selections and then tally that up that way. Any thoughts? You know that's exactly what I was trying to do with my MLC faculty and staff survey and I did you know give them a long list and ask them to check five but then I got the results all in one big clump <laughs> you know <laughs> and I had to parse out and merge together and count and things like that so I bet there's a Google add-on or plug-in or extension using the correct terminology, and and thanks for the challenge. I'll see if I can come up with something, and well, I'd love I love it. Till, I have till next week, so it gives our listeners a little time to chime yeah. in. Yeah. So there's yeah. plenty of Google form gurus out there, I know. So, um, Who's the one that always comes up with the plugins? Um, Rosano from Michigan. Um, Tom Rosano from Michigan sure. comes up with the forms or the Google Docs plugins. Maybe he's got a good idea for us. So there's there's the challenge for the week. All New right. segment. Very good. All right, let's move on to our picks of the week. All right, and I have a pick as well. Um, this is from my friend Jane Hart, and Jane is a, a learning professional. I believe that she's more of a an adult education kind of person that's done a lot of online learning. Um, but We've she's, talked about her in the past, haven't we? That's right, and I've actually pointed to her resources before, in particular her Top 100 list, and she just recently list, um, released the Top 100 Tools for Learning for 2013. Uh, so just yes. a little bit of background, she's done this since 2007 where she has um, polled learning professionals, and again, um, she, um, and I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. She, <laughs> <laughs> she's a, a, an adult learning professional, but she polls all different learning professionals, so um, K through 8, high school, university, and adult learning um, 
she brings all of them into this poll that she does. And basically she asks you to um, participate in her survey by submitting 10 items that you use for learning, 10 technology items that you use for learning. And then she does exactly what you were just saying, Martin. She kind of compiles everyone's responses and um, tallies them and comes up with her top list. And so, um, again, she's done it since 2007. So it's not just what the top 100 are, but kind of the metrics of how things change over time, new things that, that jump high up on the list, you know, things that drop on the list, all kinds of interesting um, analytics that she draws from it. So um, I guess probably for me, I'm always just kind of curious what the top 100 are. Um, and particularly like the top 10 and she she gives it to you in several different flavors she has text lists she has a presentation that you can use um, which just typically gets huge numbers of viewers um, every year um, her top 10 list is posted here in text format um, with Twitter being at number one and that's um, the same as last year so apparently educational professionals across the spectrum use Twitter to get and share good information and so that's just kind of a, um, a plug for those of you that aren't tw on Twitter that maybe don't understand Twitter or don't see the use of it if you're a teacher um, an educational professional there's a lot of great professional development going on in the Twitter space um, number two on the list is Google Drive and Docs and that's up from number three. So they moved up, um, overtaking YouTube, which moved down one space to the number three slot. So um, people are definitely making use of Drive and all the sharing capabilities and collaboration um, in the classroom and YouTube as well. Um, new to the top ten, uh, springing up six places is Evernote, Martin. You'd be proud to see Evernote represented in the top ten. And also new to the top 10 and the number 10 slot coming up seven places is Google Plus and Google Hangouts. And so more and more people are using those tools um, for um, online learning and learning in general, not just um, online classes, but to enhance face-to-face -face learning as well. So um, I think you'll want to check out her top 100 list, look a little bit deeper into some of the analysis that she provides. It's, it's an interesting list, and I'd say if you aren't using most or all of those tools in the top 10, it might be a good challenge for you to, to try something new and adopt one of those top 10 lists. Um, I guess for me, true confessions, um, Evernote's probably the only one on the top 10 that I just haven't adopted yet. I've tried it and I'm just not quite there, but maybe it's time. Yep, yep. And I guess I would say I, I'm familiar and use most of them. Facebook probably I use the least you know, of <laughs> all of them. Um, but what's interesting about this list is that there are a wealth of resources on the internet that will connect each one of them into the educational um, space. Mm -hmm. So if you are an educator, and this is really what this list is for, and you're interested in using any of these tools, um, it doesn't take you but a couple Google searches to find just a ton of materials. And we've talked about a lot of them on this show, how you can use these for education. So most of them even have a, uh, an official education site that you can use. I'm not sure about Facebook, you know, where that fits in, but the, almost all the rest. Uh, and I think some of these are not necessarily used be used by teachers in a classroom setting, but pers personal learning, you know, getting connected with other, you know, teachers, whatever. So, mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, Sally, my pick is a Chrome plugin. Let me quick, do a quick screen share here. And it is called the Always Clear Downloads. I know a lot of our listeners use Chrome. I use Chrome. You use Chrome on a regular basis, Sally. This plugin is for those of you that are just kind of annoyed with how Chrome handles downloads. You know that when you download a file using Chrome, it appear, a little uh, pane uh, appears at the bottom of the screen and then in a little button your download appears and you can kind of see the progress of it downloading which is kind of nice but once it's done downloading that thing stays there 
by default. And if you do a bunch of downloading, they just all kind of string across the bottom of the page, just taking up that precious screen real estate. Now there's usually a little X at the bottom where you can close that tab and that's probably what most of us do because we don't need to see those downloaded files in the future. There is some convenience to it because you can click and open the file right away right from that taskbar and I think that's why Google does it. But normally uh, if it's a, you know, an application install or whatever I just want it downloaded to my computer wherever I tell it to download it. I don't need Google to remind me at the bottom of my my browser screen that I downloaded something yesterday. So there's a plugin that allows you to make that go away once the download is complete. It's called Always Clear Downloads. So once you add this to Chrome, it appears as a little, um, a little, uh, what is it, a drop of water, so to speak, and it just is another thing in the top of your taskbar there, next to your URL locator. And once that's active and installed, the th everything will download just like before. But once the thing is downloaded, the file is downloaded, PDF, Word doc, whatever, even application, uh, you can see the progress. It'll stay open as long as it's downloading. And then once it's downloaded, it just disappears. It's as if uh, you clicked the X just to make it go away. So your download is still on your computer, wherever that is, in your downloads folder or desktop or wherever you have it by default set to download but you don't have to physically make that extra click or, or um, you know, do anything other than click the download and then have it be done. So as all Chrome plugins are, I think most Chrome plugins are free, so there's no cost to this, and I have noticed no ill effects on my Chrome browsing habits by having this plugin plugged in. So that is my pick of the week. Good stuff. It's all about the screen real estate, huh, Martin? Yep. Are you familiar with that one, Sally? No, that's a new one to me, so thanks okay. for sharing. Maybe you like that, that thing on the bottom, it. but uh, that just drives me nuts. So. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> okay. Let's move right along to our Wells.net feature. And, yeah, we'll extend it to Northwestern Publishing House feature today. Um, it is featured on the homepage of Wells.net, but it links over to NPH because the Forward in Christ magazine is published from Northwestern Publishing House, and there's a new digital version available of Forward in Christ. So if you enjoy Forward in Christ, now you can go digital, uh, read it on your tablet anywhere. And uh, what's nice about it is they're doing this kickoff and you can get it for free. So you can download the current version of Ford and Christ magazine for free and continue to do that through the end of the year. Uh, the, the subscription model will kick in with the January 2014 um, edition of Ford and Christ and the cost will be $15 per year for the digital <laughs> subscription. That's $2 off the print subscription price or you can get um, for $18 per year, you can still get the print copy and have the digital subscription as well. So um, just want to make sure we throw a link out there and for you guys to go and give it a try. Test drive it um, with the October issue of Forward in Christ. Yeah, works great on an iPad. I think any of the larger tablets, uh, very readable. Even the seven inch tablets, I think it's fine. Um, so yeah, that's a great value. Um, when you talk about $15 for a whole year um, and great content. So please support NPH and uh, help them to make that product better as well. Community feedback. All right. Um, we have some great stuff to share. Um, first up, a question came in from Pastor James Wilcox, who serves at Good Shepherds in West Allis. And he noticed that the Synod was doing some text to give. Um, I think it was kind of a beta um, testing out of be allowing people to use their cell phones to text a message and give to a particular cause. And we checked with our communications guy, Lee Hitter, and Lee told me and pointed me to this website, mobilecause.com. Now this isn't a free product, I think there's some fees based um, with it, but he did mention that St. Marcus in Milwaukee is using mobile cause for credit card giving and um, Pastor Kelly Hewitt might be a, a contact person um, for their experience with mobile cause. 
So. There are a yeah, there's a whole suite of tools. We just uh, at the Synod did the text to give, but there's as you mentioned the credit card giving, and there's other products available through this mobile clause site. So uh, yeah, Kelly Hewitt would be good to talk to if you're interested in that and their experiences. Excellent. Uh, next up, uh, Ryan Rosenthal from Faith and Fond du Lac tagged on Digo Common Sense Media Scope and Sequence page. Now we've talked about Common Sense Media and the great resources they have One of our available. Favorite sites, yeah. Yeah. Well, this Scope and Sequence page allows you to search um, by different categories and also th see things in grade bands K through two, three through five, six through eight, and nine through twelve. So. Um, it's a super wonderful tool to find lessons that are just right for your particular classroom. And the cross-cultural unit spiral to address digital literacy and citizenship topics in an age-appropriate way. So yeah, here we go with um, all different things and they have kind of an icon system set up as to which category it addresses and that kind of thing. So if you've checked out the site and maybe were a little overwhelmed by all that was provided there, here's the page you need to, to look at. The scope and sequence page will help you drill down to the exact resources you're looking at, looking cool. for. Super wonderful. Yep. And then I tagged a couple of things on Digo that I wanted to share. First up, I got an announcement from JotForms. Uh, we talked a little about Google Forms before. JotForms is an awesome um, and free way to create forms for the web as well. And they've extended that now to allow people to create apps um, using JotForms. So they have an API that developers can use. And they just launched this with over 100 apps um, available using JotForms. So if you're looking for some apps, this might be the place to look. They launched it by encouraging the developers to come up with um, some applications so that they had a library to start with and they put some money behind that. So there were um, winners per se um, for the best apps that were developed at this launch, um, including a form generator for WordPress. That was kind of the grand prize yeah, winner. Yeah, that was cool. Mm -hmm. So you can use Jot Forms with your WordPress installation easily. Um, in the education spectrum, there's one called EduBox, um, and it allows um, kind of a, a responsive gathering of data, kind of like the um, uh, the students would have the ability to vote or reply to questions that the teacher um, asks using their mobile devices or, or Chromebooks or whatever um, and a form input and then it would turn it into some uh, graphical uh, replies and things like that. Kind of uh, analyze the data and do some graphing and things. And then finally there was one for mobile devices called Jot Text which won um, in the mobile spectrum and Jot Text was for allowing you to receive text messages when forms are submitted. Kind of like what I was explaining about Google Forms getting an email when a form is submitted, um, Jot Text allows you to receive those notifications on your mobile device. So just a quick look at some of the apps that are available. Um, one more thing that I tagged was called Google Analytics Academy. And this is um, around Google Analytics being able to analyze um, the, the site traffic data that's gathered by Google Analytics if you're making use of that. Um, for your tracking and that kind of thing. They're actually offering a free three-week class and it starts today, so if you want to get involved, you need to get registered um, to get in on this class. But basically, they're going to teach you all the ins and outs of Google Analytics. And you can um, participate, you can test your knowledge, they have little quizzes along the way. And then there's also a, a Google Plus community that's forming around this, so you can ask questions and share ideas and learn um, from these experts on Google Analytics. So again, this class starts today, so if you want to be part of it, I know it's a tight deadline. I didn't find it until after our last podcast, or I would have announced it last week, but uh, check out Google Analytics Academy. And I think that's all we have for community feedback for this week, Martin. Very good, Sally. And if somebody wanted to contribute, how would they do that? 
Oh, there's lots of ways over on the Wells Tech website. That's at wellstech.wells.net. Um, and there's options there for all our different social channels, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Digo, and Pinterest. We have a Wells Tech Wiki, and we even have a cool little gadget. We um, encourage you to send us a voicemail. We'd love to play audio of your comments on the Wells Tech podcast. All of it at wellstech.wells.net. Very good, thank you. Please do. Next week we're going to be looking at the Wells mobile app. I happen to have one right here, um, free for anybody to download on iOS, Android, or just go to m.wells.net on your mobile device. We're going to give you a quick guided tour of some of the things that uh, go on on the app. So uh, tune in next week and uh, we'll talk about Wells mobile app. Sally, we're changing things up a little bit with our music at the end of the show, and to be honest, uh, Google made us do it. <laughs> we upload our podcasts. I'll just do a little bit of explanation. We upload our podcast to Vimeo, which then gets embedded on the Wells.net page, or our Wells. I'm sorry, our WellsTech.Wells.net page, and then I also upload it to YouTube, which is primarily the way I. Uh, have coded the mobile app to, to view videos. Problem with YouTube is they're very vigilant about any copyrighted material that appears and they've got this a logarithm that checks every upload and if you've got any copyrighted material like we do every week with our songs it flags it and says hey you've got third-party content even though I've told them every week you know that we have permission from our artists we do have written permission uh, it's a it's a ritual that I go through every week, and sometimes I'll challenge it, and uh, it'll be fine. And sometimes I'll challenge it, and it won't be fine. And that's happened enough where now I can no longer upload videos to YouTube on our account. That's a problem. So we're going to change where we upload the videos. We're going to upload them to our Wells, our our regular Wells account rather than our Wells Tech account for one. But we're not going to play the music. And I'm sure there's a lot of listeners who will miss that. But in its place, we are going to all of our musicians and asking them, would you be willing to allow our listeners to do a free download each week? So we've asked to start off with that our musicians, and I'm sure m many of them will come through for us, will uh, make a couple songs available. And at this point in the show, we'll give you a link and for one week you'll be able to download their music for free so you'll have it forever rather than just listening to the podcast so maybe that's not exactly the same but again you have uh, you have kind of a long-term gain um, with some of our beautiful Wells music uh, that is available so stay tuned hopefully we'll be able to start that next week um, so I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. So hopefully that will be uh, a little bit of a, um, a placeholder for what we had grown to love as our, our Wells Artists Music of the Week. So, so are we just going to end? Is that going to be the yeah, end? Yeah, I don't know how we're going to do nice. this. we got to find something to end with, some kind nice. of outro uh, Brinkley-esque uh, closing you know, there you we'll go. always share. We'll probably have some uh, some closing music, but it won't be... Uh, anything that, that uh, YouTube will flag on us. But again, thank you for joining us. Tune in next week. <laughs>